Uh, thank you very much, Dick. It's, uh, it's great to have known you for all these years, and Nietzsche was what sort of got me into philosophy, too, and maintained, uh, maintained my enthusiasm all these years, but I haven't been able to treat it with this level of scholarship and ingenuity that you have, but it remains an inspiration. So I particularly liked your last remark. Uh, yeah, the domestication of wild religions. Thanks, everybody, for coming out on, on this day and, and filling this room. Um, here's a little puzzle with which I want to begin. 10,000 years ago, this is after the birth of agriculture, but early in the period of civilization, certainly, the human population, plus livestock and pets, has been calculated by Paul McCready that approximately a tenth of 1% of all of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass. Now that leaves out all the insects and worms and so forth. It leaves out all the fish in the sea. But it was, we were a minor primate. Even if you added our recently domesticated cows and sheep and dogs. What do you suppose the figure would be today? Any guesses? What percentage of the terrestrial vertebrate biomass by weight do you suppose we and our pets and livestock make today? 3%. 3%. Do I hear any advance on three? <laughs> He's right. He is right, 98% in 10,000 years. This is a biologically stunning fact. Paul McCready has a wonderful thing to say about this, too. I, uh, want, I want to, as it were, give him the floor for a minute because I want to endorse the message from him as well. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted a thin covering of life complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans, a recently arrived species, no longer subject to the checks and balances inherent in nature, have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power. We now wield the paintbrush. The question is, how did we get that way? How did this amazing transformation of the planet in 10,000 years happen? We're so familiar with it, it's hard for us to see how amazing it is. Sometimes you want to make the familiar strange. So I want you to try to adopt the attitude of a curious Martian biologist. So we're going to have Martian scientists arrive at Earth. And the question is, what is going to strike them as being remarkable and much in need of explanation? Well, suppose this is what they see. Anybody have any ideas what this might be? If you just know, please. A tongue. A tongue. Some of you think it was like a tongue or a whale. I've heard that too. Or, yes? Yes, you're right. It's approximately a million human beings gathered on the banks of the river Ganges. Astonishing, an amazing gathering of bipedal mammals. Uh, surely one of the most profligate and expensive uh, coming together of, of a species that, you, that has ever been seen. And this would fascinate the, uh, this would fascinate the uh, Martians. Here's a somewhat smaller gathering, but equally amazing. Tremendously costly, tremendously intricate. Here's another. These would impress Martian biologists. They would want to know what on earth was causing this and how it got going. Here is a map, not particularly reliable, which just looks at the, at the uh, distribution of religions by, by sort of dominant religion around the world. They would be able to d discern that and wonder about it. They would look at the proportions which right now leads with Christianity leading at about 33%, uh, Islam, and non-religious and Hinduism all roughly equal. 
Today, there are roughly 749 million atheists in the world, twice as many atheists as Buddhists, 40 times more atheists than Jews, more than 50 times as many atheists as Mormons. That's an interesting fact, too, which many people don't know. That comes from Zuckerman's study of 2006. According to the World Christian Encyclopedia, which is a very, very authoritative uh, survey of, of religions in general, the only major religion that is growing worldwide is Islam, and secularism or non-religionists are growing even faster. I draw these facts to your attention because whatever you think about religion, whether you want one religion to flourish and dominate the world, if you want that map to go all one color, or whether you want religion to die away, or whether you have some other goal in mind, whatever happens, and nobody knows what's going to happen in the next hundred years, let us say, surely whatever happens is important and we might want to try to steer the future as best we can, and if we want to do that, we need to understand what religions are, how they got to where they are, so that we can see what their future might hold. Southern Baptists are baptizing about 300,000 a year now, which is about the same as the 1950s, for instance, while the U.S. population has doubled. That's an interesting fact to anybody who thinks that there's been a huge upsurge of relig religious membership in this country in recent years. It's not true. There's been a huge upsurge in public attention to religion and public declarations about religion, but the church membership is, in fact, across the board, not up. Maybe you wish it would go up. Uh, maybe you wish it would go down. The Martian wants to ask, what accounts for all these patterns in the world? Here we have a cow. Not a sacred cow, at least not to me, and not probably not, maybe not to anybody in the room. This is just a very fine milk cow. Now, here's a curious question. Who designed the milk cow? Well, the answer is actually that quite a few breeders have played quite a big role in the design of the milk cow. The cow you see in front of you has been, is the product of a, of a growingly sophisticated process of research and development over the last few hundred years. Compare that with its ancestor, the aurochs. This is the ancestor of all domesticated cattle. Who designed the aurochs? Well, one answer, of course, is God designed the aurochs. Another answer is natural selection designed the aurochs over millions of years. No intelligent designer designed the aurochs. And the aurochs, as a wild species, what was it for? It was for making more auroxes. That's all it was for. But once domestication started, human individuals of varying intelligence began to reverse engineer the cow, finding the parts, seeing how they meshed, how the parts fit together, how you could optimize this, the cost benefits of fixing that and adjusting this, and what was possible and what wasn't possible. And the result, of that reverse engineering is the milk cow of today, a domesticated animal. You will probably guess at what my punchline is. The same thing is true of religions. Organized religions today are brilliantly designed, and they have an evolutionary history. They started out wild and they were then domesticated. And if we understand this history of where religions came for, from, how they started, what they turned into, and what they've become, then we'll have some better idea of where they might go in the future. The design that is manifestly evident in a milk cow is also manifestly evident in religions. They are intricately, cunningly, well-designed social phenomena at many levels. They're 
their political structures, their creeds, their art, their architecture, their music, their prohibitions, their obligations. All of this bears unmistakable signs of design. But so does the aurochs, and so does the milk cow. And what the Martian scientists will want to do, what we want to do, is to study that design with all the intensity and objectivity that we can study any biological phenomenon, any natural phenomenon. In other words, what I want to do, and it's only just beginning, is I want us to reverse engineer religions. To see why they have the features they have, how they got the features they have, so we can see how we might adjust those designs in the future, if we want to. How do all this originate? That's what the Martians would want to know. What is it for? It's got to be for something, because nothing as intricate and complex and expensive as a brilliantly designed thing like a religion just happens by accident. Something has to benefit from all of this design work over time. But it may be that the beneficiaries shift over time, and I'm going to say more about that. How does it perpetuate itself? There is not much inertia in the cultural world. If a tradition ceases to, to put it crudely and crassly, pay for itself in some coin, it will soon go extinct. So the persistence of religions, their various features, is itself something that requires explanation. Now, something which is often not realized that there's been hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of religions since the first wild religions. Most of those have gone extinct. Is this really true? Yes, it really is. I mean, we, we know about hundreds, thousands, actually, of short-lived religions that have, have grown up and then gone extinct. There's a website, I can't remember the URL of it right now, which is a up-to-date current website on the birth of new sects. They can't keep up with them. There's a religion born every day, in fact, more than one. And as you know, most of them go extinct almost immediately, within a few years at, at most, sometimes a generation, sometimes a few. The religions that we see, the religions that have churches and temples and mosques that survive for hundreds of years, these long-lived religions are a hardy few. What do they have that lets them survive? What do the other ones lack? Those that go extinct often pass on some of their themes to competitors that survive. Can we trace these interesting features from religion to religion? That's part of the empirical investigation that I want to explore. And you'll notice that a lot of this is research that's already been done for hundreds of years. There's people, scholars of religious history, who've traced doctrines and themes, uh, uh, language and distinctions through uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of, of uh, creedal variation and uh, continuation. But they haven't typically thought about this work in the reverse engineering spirit that I'm recommending. I find that uh, uh, actually a, a mixed blessing. I think the fact that they weren't thinking about it with that, with that attitude is actually a blessing in one sense. It means that since they weren't trying to establish a particular evolutionary hypothesis about these features, we don't have to worry too much about observer bias in the gathering of the data. Darwin, by the way, was similarly blessed. All those naturalists, all those people engaged in natural history, all the vicars and curates with their butterfly collections and the bird watchers and the pigeon fanciers, they had a mountain of data which he put to very good use. Fortunately, they were not already Darwinians. They were trying to prove his theory. They never even imagined his theory for the most part. That's why their data were relatively unimpeachable. 
I mention this because I don't, some people think that I'm saying that there hasn't been a long tradition of, of fine, rigorous scholarship about religions in their history. No, there has been. And I want to make all of the fruits of that scholarship available in a new way to a somewhat different kind of investigation. What is it about the survivors? Of course, one possibility is that one of them is simply the truth. Now, you may well think that the reason that your religion is surviving is because it's, the, it's God's honest truth. Fair enough, you might be right, but what about your religions? Why are they surviving? Can't be because they're true, because they disagree with yours. No religion holds a majority of uh, adherence. So most of the people who believe in any religion presumably believe in a religion which isn't true. So we should set aside truth for the time being and look at these phenomena just objectively as interesting, fascinating social phenomena and see if we can figure out how they've managed to uh, accrue the features that they have and the allegiances that they have over the centuries. So there may be better, better explanations. Now, my book, as Richard Schock mentioned, is called Breaking the Spell. And you now know the meaning of the title, Breaking the Spell. The spell that I want to break is the spell which says, don't look at religion this way. It's a sort of polite taboo against looking too closely and scientifically at religions. Now, one reason for not breaking the spell might be that if we break one spell, if we break that spell, the examination of religion might break the spell of religion itself might somehow demystify it in such a way that, that people, they would sort of lose their virginity for religion and they could no longer be religious. That is, I think, a common fear among many people. I think it is largely misguided. But it might not be. But in any case, having looked hard at that question of environmental impact, I've decided it's more important that we go ahead and do the examination. Taking the risks involved, let's see what religions look like if we pull aside the veil, the protective gauze of, of uh, sanctity, and look hard and objectively at religion. Maybe we'll discover what makes religions really good, after all. It's the only way we could ever find out an answer to that question. Well, now, here's something else that might uh, amaze the Martian, or it might amaze you. You go out in a field and you see an ant climbing a blade of grass. And it climbs and climbs and climbs. And if you flick it off, it climbs some more. And it climbs and climbs, expending a lot of energy until it gets to the very top of the blade of grass. And you might ask yourself, well now, what's it doing? Why is it doing this? What benefit accrues to the ant from all of this expenditure of energy? Is it is it showing off, trying to get a mate? Is it looking for food? Is it trying to find its way home? Is it engaging in exercise to strengthen its leg muscles? What is it doing and why, what benefit accrues to the ant? Good questions, but they're the wrong questions, in fact. No benefit, as far as we know, accrues to the ant at all. Well, then why is it doing that? Is it just a fluke? Yeah, it's just a fluke. It's a lancet fluke, <laughs> which is a little parasitic brain worm which is lodged in the ant's brain. Dicocelium dendriticum has to get into the belly of a ruminant, a sheep or a cow, in order to continue its life cycle, in order to reproduce. So just the way salmon swim so nobly upstream so that they can spawn, Dicocelium dendriticum grabs out of a passing ant, climbs into its brain, and drives it like an all-terrain vehicle up a blade of grass, <laughs> putting it in a better position to be eaten by a sheep or a cow. <laughs> no benefit accrues to the ant, but benefit accrues to Dicrocelium dendriticum. This is a case of parasite manipulation of host, and there are many others. Uh, if we had more time, I would I have my gallery of these amazing examples, but we will, we'll just stick with this one. That's spooky enough. Here we have a hijacker 
It's a parasite that infects the brain and induces suicidal behalf, uh, behavior on behalf of a cause other than one's own genetic fitness. Pretty spooky. Pretty strange. Yeah, I wonder if anything like that ever happens to us. <laughs> well, let me just remind you that the Arabic word Islam means submission. It means surrender of self-interest to the will of Allah. The very name of the religion of Islam honors the very idea that is illustrated by that ant climbing the blade of grass. But it's not just Islam. Christianity does much the same thing. Here's a bad photograph. I apologize for the quality of this. Of a, of a manuscript, a, music, a page or a parchment page of manuscript that I found in a Paris bookstore about 50 years ago. And uh, the writing on it is interesting. It says, Semen est verbum dei sa tor autem Christus omnis creaudit eum manebit in eternum. By the way, those of us who love genetic approaches to texts can find some special pleasure in this one. Right in the middle, you see the word Christus. It's spelled with two Greek letters. There's a Cairo so that the Latin scribe who wrote this put in the Greek letters for the first two letters of Christus, and then, not knowing that the row was an R, added an R, sort of belt and suspenders principle. So we have a nice <laughs> example of a sort of uh, mean duplication here. Uh, but what does that mean? Samen est web in dei sator autem. It means the word of God is a seed, and the soul of the seed is Christ. And if you will carry the seed and spread it around, you will have eternal life. Here's a Christian phrase. The heart of worship is surrender. Surrendered people obey God's word, even if it doesn't make sense. Now, where do you suppose those two quotes came from? They came from Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, <laughs> which has sold about 40 million copies, I think, so far. It's one of the best-selling books in the world. Second, I think, only to the Bible, maybe. There it is. By the way, I had a little debate with Rick Warren out in uh, Monterey last year. If you, you can find it on the web. I think it's, there's a webcast of that, sort of interesting. He uh, refused to debate me, actually. But I did a sort of a... <laughs> He went on first and gave a very powerful talk, and then I came on and did a reverse engineering of his book. <laughs> but we have our ideas to die for. Islam is, I've already mentioned, and Christianity, of course. But not just those. Think of all the people in the last century who died for communism, or for democracy, or for freedom, or for justice. This is remarkable. These are really ideas to die for. People die, and they kill for them too, of course. And this is itself biologically remarkable. Let's consider the last case, freedom. This is the license plate of the state of New Hampshire, right? Just north of where I live. Live free or die. You can't put it much more pithily than that. <laughs> I want to draw your attention to an interesting fact. The moose lives in New Hampshire, but he can't appreciate this at all. <laughs> the moose is simply incapable of adopting a perspective that could appreciate or fail to appreciate this motto. Because the moose, like all other species except for us, has only one sumum bonum, and that is to make lots of little mooses. Can I, let me, let me just do a little poll. How many here are parents? How many are grandparents? How many want to be parents at some point in their lives? And grandparents, yes. How many people think that the most important thing in life is having more grandchildren than the next person? <laughs> I do not see a single hand up. That is biologically remarkable. Every other species has as their summum bonum making more of their kind. And everything that they do is focused 
on accomplishing that end. And we're the only species that can say, no, no. Many things, or there's one thing that's more important to me than having lots of kids. I submit that right there we can see how we managed to turn the planet so much in the last 10,000 years. The fact that we can live and die for an idea. It is biologically remarkable, and that means that we need to look for biological explanations of such facts. And the answer simply is that it's ideas, not worms, that hijack our brains. Now, this is an idea that has been popularized and also demonized in response to that popularization by uh, Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene. These themes or ideas are what he calls memes. They're analogous, he says, to genes. He points out that Darwinian processes, what I call the Darwinian algorithm of differential replication, mutation, survival, but that algorithm doesn't depend on protein or DNA. It could occur in any medium. And he suggested 30 years ago that culture could be seen as including many self-replicating ideas that differ in their ability to get people to copy them and pass them on. And that the ideas that get the most copies and that spread the most effectively are the ones that will be visible and potent and playing a big role in the future. And he, call, he says these are analogous to genes. Well, you might say the trouble is that, you know, what are, what are ideas made of? Well, what are genes made of? The short answer is DNA, but that's not really true even. Uh, well, think about a virus. Certainly viruses are subject to, to evolution in a big way. HIV has evolved more since it was first sequenced than our species has, than the genome of our species has evolved uh, uh, since we split from the chimpanzee in terms of sheer amount of evolution. Much, much faster. What is, it, what is a virus? A virus is basically just uh, a string of nucleic acid with attitude. <laughs> it's not alive. It just has this amazing structural property, which means that when it gets into a cell, it provokes that cell to make copies of it. It commandeers the reproductive machinery of a cell to make more copies of it. You don't have to have a mind to do this. You just have to be designed to provoke that sort of effect. Remember Dr. Seeley and Dan Vidium, it's not very smart. It doesn't even have a nervous system. Dicrocelium dendriticum, the one that, that gets in the ant's brain, is I would think its IQ is in the range of a carrot. It's, you don't have to be smart. You just have to be well-designed by evolution to do the job. Those that are well-designed will replicate better than those that are not quite so well-designed. I love this quote. This is from a theologian. The, survival of the, if the survival of the fittest has any validity as a slogan, then the Bible seems a fair candidate for the accolade of the fittest of texts. In the simple but biologically appropriate sense of there's more copies of it than any other text. It's been very good at getting itself copied, translated, copied, reprinted, translated, translated, copied, 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 put in hotels everywhere. <laughs> a very successful meme. Notice but that judgment is not a value judgment. It says nothing about the quality, the utility, the truth or falsity. It just says this text, this cultural item has replicated like bunny rabbits, only better. <laughs> Human culture is itself one of the fruits on the tree of life. And we need to understand it. If we, if we have a, a dichotomy which says, well, is it biological or is it cultural, we've already made a mistake. Culture is a product of the tree of life. And the, 
A beaver dam is a product, is one of the fruits on the tree of life, and so is the Hoover Dam. A spider's web is a product of evolution, and so is the World Wide Web. They are artifacts made by living species, and they have been devised, adjusted, made possible by the evolution of the species that made them. So pursuing Dawkins' idea, we see that culture is composed of symbionts, just like the, all the living symbionts in our own bodies. And there are really three biology, biological theory would say there's three kinds of symbionts. There's the mutualists, which are fitness enhancing, like, like the, the flora in your gut, without which you would die, that help you digest your food. You need those. You could not live without them. There are many symbionts that live in your body that you could not live without. Commensals are the neutral ones, which is probably most of them, in fact, probably 90% of them. The ones that are at the same table, but don't either help you or hurt you. You can get rid of them or keep them, doesn't matter. They don't care. And then there's the parasites, official parasites, the ones that are fitness reducing. Now, in saying that religious ideas are symbionts, I'm not making any value judgment about them. They may be neutralists. They may be very good for us. They may be neutral. They may be bad for us but in the sense of being fitness reducing. But remember. Fitness reduction is of no interest to us, right? There wasn't a single person who said that their biological fitness was the most important thing to them. Think of what that means. It means that each one of you puts something else ahead of genetic fitness. That's just not your highest value. How is that possible? Because of the way that our brains have been invaded by memes and have created new structures and made us into a different kind of thing. A person. A person, you might say, is an ape with an infected brain. But what a wonderful infection. Look what it's made possible. By the way, too, see, a lot of people, they, I begin my book with the example of Dipracelium dendriticum, the ant and the, and the worm in its brain. And people say, that's so awful, it's so repulsive, you're going to, you're going to turn off all the religious people. Here you are comparing religion to, to a worm in an ant's brain right on page one. This is, this is such a stupid idea, Dan. And I say, no, I, well, I say, maybe a stupid idea. I don't know. But, but I want to, sh to, to, to shock them into a recognition that the perspective of science is strikingly unlike their usual perspective. But in fact, if they think about it carefully and calmly, which is hard for many people to do, they will realize that it is not necessarily antagonistic. After all, even parasites can be good for you. I have a colleague at Tufts. Uh, uh, I've only, I haven't met him directly, but I've uh, communicated with him. He's done some very interesting work. Um, uh, oh, wait a minute. Um, that's funny. I guess I didn't save those slides. I thought they were coming up next. Well, I'll just tell you about him. Joe Weinstock is a, is a research MD at Tufts Medical. And his particular, his particular specialty is helminths. That is, worms, the kind that infect your body, that can get in your body. I mean, not little tiny microscopic ones, but worms that, are, that can grow to be several inches long. And his claim is that the rise of asthma, uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, several other diseases, which are immune system disorders, it's due to the fact that we've eliminated in the, in the industrialized world too many of the parasites, too many of the worms. But the worms, which inf infect the bodies of everybody else in the developing world, actually now are necessary to us because our immune systems have evolved with them for so long that the worms downregulate our immune systems. And if you remove them, the immune system's going to overdrive. And that's what causes 
these diseases. So asthma is essentially unknown in the developing world. It's epidemic in, in, in the, you know, the cleanest countries in Western Europe. And there's some good evidence. He's actually begun treating patients of, with inflammatory bowel, with Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, by giving them, I have a slide that shows him, I'm going to take two in the morning and call him. <laughs> they're they're hookworm eggs. And uh, they, they go into the gut and they grow and they downregulate the, uh, the, uh, the immune system. And in the six patients that's been tried for so far, there's been essentially complete remission of all symptoms. So let's not be so sure that, that we should be so down on parasites. They can be, they can be your friend. So how did human culture get started? How did the ideas of religion originate? How have they evolved? Oh, darn it. Something's happened to my slides. I'm sorry. I, I must have jumbled up a few. Oh, mother. Let's see, what am I going to do about this? All right. I'm, I'm way off. Some slides have just disappeared here. Help, I, have I got the right one here? No, I'm really in trouble. And now, of course, it won't switch over. There we go. Okay. Excuse me. I, I'll find out later what I what I did that was wrong with my PowerPoint. Let me go back to the beginning and talk about how the original wild forms of religion originated. This is speculative, but I just want to give you a how possibly story so you can see how it might start. And there seems to be a fair amount of agreement for what that's worth among the people that are working on this. And it begins with an instinct that we share with other mammals. For instance, with your dog. You have a dog and it's asleep on the hearth and there's a, it's the springtime and the, a big snow robe slides off the roof and lands thump on the ground outside the window and the dog jumps up growling. Uh, who's there? Who's there? Not what's that? Who's there? The dog will go back to sleep in a minute or so. When we are startled or surprised or puzzled by something we can't make sense of, we have the same instinct. Who is there? An agent. Something that has wants and desires. In my terms, it's the intentional stance. But uh, it's now called by many people the hyperactive agent detection device. This is an instinct. This is something that we're born with. Something happens that we don't understand. Our immediate default presumption is to see if it might be something that has wants and beliefs. Why? Because it might want us. That's something you always want to know. It's ecologically significant. And in us, this doesn't stop because we have language, which has evolved too. And so let me, I'll just give you a little cartoon sketch of this. So you're out, you're out walking in the woods. It's getting a little bit late. And maybe you've got a friend with you. And something moves, something moves. Like, who, what? who goes there? Who, who's there? Oh my God. Who, what, who? Oh, that tree, did, did that tree just talk? Oh, no. Trees can't talk. No, no. Trees can't. No. A talking tree? No. And your friend says, what? So, oh, for a moment there, I thought there was a talking tree. <laughs> a talking tree? You think it was talking trees? Trees can't talk. Well, no, trees can talk. No, I don't think so, but it sure seemed like. How many times did I say talking tree? About 15 times there. That's the birth of a meme, the talking tree meme. And it's already reproduced in my brain half a dozen times, and now I've spread it to my friend. Goes back to the village. Pretty soon, everybody's talking about the talking tree. And some people say, there's no talking trees. Other people say, I don't know. If they think it was a talking tree, maybe it was a talking tree. <laughs> and so within that little group, a new imaginary agent has been created, the talking tree. Now, that's pretty lame. That's pretty dumb. But you have to imagine that many of these events happen. 
Mostly they're forgotten as soon as they occur, but you, by the time you're out of the woods, you've already forgotten whatever little fantasy you might have conjured up as a result of the misfiring of your hyperactive agent detection device. But some of them, which ones? The unforgettable ones, the memorable ones, the ones that are contagious, that are passed easily to your fellows. Pretty soon, each community has its own little menagerie of imaginary creatures, elves and leprechauns and ghosts and goblins and talking trees and the like. And they are competing for rehearsal space in the brains of the community. Those are memes. So we get this population and they compete for rehearsal space. And what are the winners for? The winners are for occupying the minds they find themselves in. That's all they're for. They reproduce because they can. I want to drive this point home because it's one of the main points of my book. People, when they found out I was writing a book on evolution of religions, they said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Um, Gee, I've often wondered what religion's for. It's got to be for something. It's got to be good for something, because after all, every human group that's ever been studied has something like a religion. So what do you think it's good for? And I said, well, that's probably the wrong question. Every human group that's ever been studied also has the common cold. What's that good for? <laughs> it's good for making more cold viruses. That's all it's good for. It reproduces because it can. The original ancestors, the wild ancestors of organized religion, I'm suggesting, were in contagious, infectious means that spread because they could spread. So how are spoken words, not written words, but spoken words in folk songs like squirrels, rats, pigeons, and barn swallows? When I say folk songs, I don't mean Woody Guthrie folk songs. I mean real folk songs, folk songs that have no identifiable author or writer, which there are many. The answer is they're wild, not domesticated, but they're designed by evolution to thrive in human company. A chimney swift makes its nest in a chimney, but it does not belong to, it is not the property, it is not domesticated of the person whose chimney that is. It is a wild animal that is beautifully adapted to live with human beings. And so are these ideas. There are wild ideas that nobody was their author. Nobody had to be their author. They have simply emerged from mindless processes, and now the best of them, the ones that are the most unforgettable and most spreadable and infectious, are occupying the minds of people all over the world. Some of them, however, may be good for us. How clever of sheep to acquire shepherds. This is a tremendous fitness boost to them in the classical sense. There are hundreds of millions of sheep in the world today, and only their nearest wild relative is probably only hundreds of. So that was a fitness boost. But of course, it wasn't the sheep's cleverness. They were fortunate to get themselves domesticated, and similarly, wild means of religion got themselves domesticated. Now, sheep are pretty stupid. It's not the cleverness of the sheep. This is a slide that was back there a bit that somehow got bumped up. It's the cleverness of the process of natural selection. Leslie Evans' rule, evolution is cleverer than you are. Sheep are stupid. Like the sheep did, sheep acquired shepherds, the wild means of religion acquired stewards. Some of the ideas that we pass along have stewards, that is, teachers, protectors, guardians. Calculus comes to mind. I don't think many of you go down the street thinking, oh, darn, I just can't get those second derivatives out of my head, you know? It's just, it's like a, you know, Germans have this wonderful word, uh, uh, an earworm, an earworm, for a tune, a jingle that you get in your head and you can't get it out of your head and you just go repeating it and then you uh, infect your neighbor and really hates you for passing that tune on. <laughs> Those are the wild ones. You may have noticed that calculus does not have that property. 
the calculus has to be spread by the laborious, careful, ingenious, planned, deliberate activities of teachers of calculus. It is so domesticated that it cannot replicate on its own. It's like in that regard many laying hens, which if it would go extinct if the farmers weren't there to incubate the eggs for them because they've lost their broodiness. So what happened is that the wild means of, the means of wild religion got themselves domesticated by acquiring stewards who were prepared to devote their lives to their flourishing. And when folk religions became organized religion, there was a tremendous shift in the design process because what I call free-floating rationales of the original religions were replaced with represented rationales. I don't have time. Uh, running a little bit late to go into the distinction I made between free floating. The free floating rationale is the, is the reason why a biological phenomenon has the features it has, even though those, that reason has never been represented anywhere. I'll give you a, a simple case. I don't have the slides in here to show you, I don't think. No, I, I took them out. Cuckoos are brood parasites. Cuckoos, the birds, they do not make their own nests. The mother cuckoo, when she's ready to lay her egg, she finds uh, the nest of a, of a host species, say a wren, and she's going to lay, she waits till the, till the wren lays her eggs in the nest. Then when the wren is off feeding, the cuckoo swoops down, lays her egg very quickly in the wren's nest, then sometimes we'll push one of the wren eggs out. That's just in case wrens can count. <laughs> and flies away never to return. When the cuckoo egg hatches, and by the way, they tend to uh, incubate faster than the, than the uh, host eggs. So the first one out will probably be the cuckoo. The first thing it does, it's this little featherless scrawny little thing, the first thing it does is it shoulders those other eggs, if it can, both of them, or however many they are, out of the nest, pushes them right over the edge. Why? In order to maximize the, the benefit from the wren parents that are going to raise the bird. Now, that little cuckoo bird doesn't understand this. You might say, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. What a burden it would be to be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, to be a murderer from the moment you... Uh, uh, it doesn't have to understand it. The rationale is clear. I've just explained to you, and I think you can all see, boy, well, that's a really clever idea. That's a free-floating rationale. It's never represented anywhere until some biologist probably thought of it and wrote it down and said, oh, I see, I figured out what this is all about, and then you can test that. So evolution proceeds with what I call free-floating rationales. That's, that's, what the reverse engineering, what emerges from the exercise of reverse engineering is you begin to understand the rationales of all of these biological processes. But then once you get human beings involved, they start coming up with their own rationales. And now we're, we're talking about representative rationales. They're talking it over. They're scheming. They're thinking about it. They are trying to be intelligent designers. And that changes everything. The rationales of the stewards were responsive to other goals, to, more, to represented goals. And this means a shift in the whole design process. In the same way that if we look at the cow, domesticated cow, many of the features of the cow show that these are really features designed for the stewards, not for the cow's well-being uh, directly. I want to give you some examples of adaptations of religions which are not found in wild religions but only in domestic religions, domesticated religions. And that my favorite example, I have a whole chapter on this in my book, is what I call belief in belief. Well, what do I mean? Well, some people believe in God. Many people believe in God. Some people believe in belief in God. That is to say, they think belief in God is a wonderful thing. Let's hear it for belief in God but they don't believe in God themselves. Maybe they're guilty about this. They've lost their belief in God. They wish they could maintain it. They do not believe in God, darn it. But they wish they did. They believe in belief in God. 
I want to make a curious point. More people believe in belief in God than believe in God. How so? Well, presumably all the people who believe in God also believe in belief in God, with a few exceptions. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever met anybody who says, darn, I just can't get rid of that awful, embarrassing belief in God that I hear. <laughs> um, there may be some. Those would be people who actually believe in God, but don't believe in belief in God. So we're supposed to a first approximation that all the people that believe in God also believe in belief in God. But then there's all the people who only believe in belief in God and don't believe in God. So there's more of the latter. And what I'm going to claim next is it's belief in belief in God that is now in the driver's seat. It's the one that's doing all the work. Well, not all the work, but most of the work. Belief in God itself, the primary state, is playing a secondary role at best. It's belief in belief in God, which is the politically potent psychological state. A few examples. Self-reported church attendance is consistently higher than church attendance measured directly. <laughs> My favorite, though, is, hey, we're not atheists. We all believe in God in our own ways. This is a very familiar, we've all heard this phrase. Um, why do we say this? Because of belief and belief in God. When you think of how different the conceptions of, are of God, it's just amazing that we, we take some sort of pleasure or some sort of satisfaction or relief and say, well, at least we're not atheists. We believe in God. <laughs> belief and belief in God has eclipsed belief in God as a reason. I love this Gainsbury. It's commencement time. And finally, dear Lord, mystery of mysteries, whose essence we cannot know, whether you be the loving, inclusive God of compassion and social justice, or the angry, intolerant God who hates gays and told Bush to invade Iraq, we beseech you to be the former. Let us explain. Amen, damn it. <laughs> well, those two gods are different, but they're God's more different than that still, to the point where I think it's just sort of a bad pun to say, well, you know, we're not atheists, we all believe in God. There's Lucy, and she thinks rock is to die for. And Busy thinks rock is to die for. The thing is that Lucy's thinking of Rock Hudson. Busy's thinking of rock music. They're not really agreeing on anything. I submit that rock music and rock Hudson are no more different than the different gods that many people say they believe in, and yet they say, well, at least we're not atheists. A very distinguished Protestant minister of my acquaintance told me that when he found out what his Mormon friends thought God was, he rather wished they didn't believe in God. <laughs> But he didn't want, of course, to say that from the pulpit. Why not? Because of belief in belief in God. Now, we're all familiar with belief in belief in God. It's, it's ubiquitous. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that it is essentially unknown in, in tribal religion, in folk religion. They don't have this concept at all. They don't need it. This is, this is a recent domesticated variation. A few others. Don't blame God. Think about when the tsunami, when Katrina came through. On every side, we get the question, don't blame God. It's not God's fault. But thank God for all the good things. This is one way ratchet where God gets the credit for the good things and gets thanked and doesn't get blamed for the bad things. That's not true in folk religions. They blame their gods all the time. <laughs> this, is, this is a recent sophistication of organized religion. Surrendered people obey God's word, even if it doesn't make sense. I like this. As, this is an adaptation. This particular quote comes from uh, um, uh, Rick Warren, but it's, he didn't, he's not the author of it. This has been around for many, many centuries, this idea that incomprehensibility is no bar. I like this one, too. Don't ever try to argue with the devil who's better at arguing than you are having had thousands of years to practice. 
This has many versions too. This is again Rick Warren's version. But it's a, you'll notice that it is an elegantly designed, all purpose wild card uh, authority reducer. Whenever anybody who is reasonable, open minded, just wants to be rational, let's talk this through. Don't talk to that person, that's the devil. A wild card for disarming any reasonable criticism. Yet another one is that, and the most ubiquitous one, is that belief in God is a requirement of morality. Here's a version of it that I took a picture of. I was driving up to my farm in Maine, and the, the, the Windsor Church had this sort of cute, good without God becomes zero. This is sort of, sort of cute arithmetic, right? <laughs> It's catchy. I'm, I'm sort of reluctant to give it to you because now you're going to spread it, you see. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trouble, you see, it means. It's, it's catchy, it's memorable. But catchy and memorable doesn't mean true. And I think we all know it's just not true. It is this idea that morality without religion is impossible, that the God-fearing a man is the only moral man, that the godless person cannot be moral, is belied by everything we know. And yet, this idea is still paid lip service to, around, especially in this country. That's why we don't have, but we have just one now representative, Representative Stark from California, who admits that he is an atheist and he is a member of Congress. He's the first in the history of the country. Somebody asked me recently, when do you think we'll have an atheist president? I said, well, we've had atheist presidents, they just haven't been willing to admit it. <laughs> and I think this is true. Religions are powerful forces in people's lives. Religions are brilliantly designed. Whether you want to spread them further and help them overcome their limitations or whether you want to see them go extinct, we better understand what they are first because our best intention moves may not be good enough. Good intentions are not enough. When we understand their design, we can better see what we might do or should do to revise their design or improve them. In the meantime, what should we do? I have one policy recommendation that was mentioned right at the beginning. I'm glad I've got this slide in here because I want to come back to it. Uh, it was mentioned in, in the original introduction. I, at the close of my book, I have one policy proposal, and that is that education on world religions, this is the fourth R, for all of our children in public schools, private schools, and in homeschooling, and for homeschoolers, this would be compulsory education on the facts, history, creed, rituals, music, symbols, ethical commands, and prohibitions. We should have this policy for a very simple reason. If we have this policy, any religion can th that can thrive deserves to thrive. And any religion which cannot thrive under this condition of knowledge doesn't deserve to thrive, deserves to go extinct. As long as you teach them this, I say you may teach your children anything else you want, anything, so long as it doesn't disable them with fear or uh, uh, hatred. So it's in fact a very, even a libertarian idea. You can teach your children whatever you want, but you also have to teach them these facts about the religions of the world, including your own religion. The reason I argue for this is that it strikes me and this is an empirical claim, I'd be interested to see whether anybody thinks it's false, that the toxic forms of religion, which can be found in every, every variety of religion, in Islam, in Hindu, in, 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 in Catholicism, in Protestantism, and across the board we have toxic forms of religion, and they all depend on enforced ignorance of the young. They all do. So if we can simply remove that enforced ignorance, then we encourage the evolution of benign forms of religion. And for the same reason that we don't want to eliminate all of our symbionts, all of our bacteria, we don't want to get rid of our germs and kill us. 
What we want to do is to encourage the evolution of avirulence in our germs. We want to encourage them the evolution of benign v versions of them. And that's what we can do if we understand what we're doing. A religion that can flourish in a world of mutual knowledge of the facts about world religions is a benign religion. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Um, thank you very much for your talk. That was really good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, obviously, one of the things that perhaps makes a meme, a religious meme, successful is that its ability to explain some physical or, or psychological phenomena that we don't yet have a rational explanation for. Um, and I'd like to ask you about the, uh, the psychological experience that is common to many religious practices and things of meditation and the, the, the experience of expanded consciousness and that sort of thing, which, which you see in Hinduism, in Buddhism, and even in Christianity. Um, how does that psychological experience, which, which many would argue we don't yet, even in you know, today's society, today's science, have an explanation for, relate to perhaps the, the, this, this need for these memes to explain that experience? If that makes any sense. Well, um, good. The, uh, I think the development of, as it were, techniques of meditation is no more puzzling biologically than the development of techniques of masturbation. They're not fitness enhancing, necessarily, <laughs> but one can, one can see how they exploit something which is fitness enhancing. Now, meditation practices would be discovered again and again in different cultures and different times by, by different people, and, and you would see characteristic differences in meditation. And as you say, it provides a wonderful sense of well-being and a calmness and an ability to get clarity in your life. These are good things. They often are developed in religious, in, in consort with, in concert with particular religious doctrines, but that's not actually necessary. They're sort of completely non-religious versions of meditation that have emerged. The explanation idea is, I think, somewhat orthogonal, plays a role here, plays a role in many places. Um, we're the creature that asks why. I've got a paper by on my website called The Evolution of Why. The question why. And the practice of asking why questions and why we ask the why question. And I think that there's as were independent reasons why we're why askers. And then when there isn't any other answer available, religious answers are, have the virtue of being readily generated and largely unconfirmable and undisconfirmable. Now, if you go back far enough, if you go back to folk religions, you see that there's really no difference between science and religion. It's all just what everybody knows. And when the father teaches his son how to hunt, he teaches the son a lot of natural history about the species and their habits, but right along with it, he's teaching which gods you should make a sacrifice to and so forth. And it's all mushed together and they don't distinguish. Well, this is the religious part, this is the science part. Now, now that's a much later, much more sophisticated uh, development. After all, people who practice folk religion don't realize they're practicing a folk religion. They don't ha even have a word for religion. That's, that's a much later sophistication. Yeah. What do you think uh, the future holds for religion and humanity in general, if this inquiry is successful, and if it's not? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. So 50 yeah. years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000, I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, I, I start the book with some scenarios. And I want to sort of tease the reader and say, which do you think is more likely? One hypothesis is that one religion wins and goes to fixation around the globe. A lot of people fervently hope for it, trying to accomplish this. What are the odds? Some, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that it evolves into something very different. It's more like being a Yankees fan, or it's more like sports teams. You know, songs, different songs, different allegiances, a lot of pageantry, a lot of ritual, a lot of, a lot of powerful uh, uh, allegiance. You know, would you want your daughter to marry a Yankees fan? Uh, uh, that sort of thing. 
and, and maybe also, much less trivial in sports, doing good works. And I think that's the direction that a lot of people would like to see religion go. Another one is that religion becomes more like smoking. Some people seem to need it. It's all right, just don't blow the smoke in my face. And <laughs> religions, some people would like to imagine a day when, when it's considered sort of bad form to mention that a political candidate is religious uh, at all. It's sort of like mentioning that he's been divorced or that, or that she's a smoker. Uh, you just, yeah, yeah, some people do this, but we don't have to, we don't have to, as it were, hold them up to, to uh, scrutiny on this. This is a privacy matter. That's another, then of course there's the possibility that judgment day will come. Armageddon, you know. Well, <laughs> those are all, these are all real possibilities. The one actually that I'm most amused by is that, is that, uh, that religion will die out to the point where, uh, well, I have some slides I didn't show them today, where, uh, you know, within the lifetime of our, of our grandchildren, um, um, the Vatican becomes the European Museum of Roman Catholicism, and Mecca becomes the Disney's Magic Kingdom of Allah. <laughs> uh, um, if you think that's impossible, you should bear in mind that the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul started as a church, then it became a mosque, and now it's a museum. So I really don't know what religions are going to become, but I think it's a very important, that's why I wrote the book. I think we should try to find out, and because it really matters to me, and I hope to you, which of these is the right, which of these futures is, is accessible from where we are now. I would like not to do anything that was counterproductive, and I notice that religions have, are evolving faster and faster. The religion of today, in general, is hugely different from the religion of 100 years ago, and hugely different from the religion of 1,000 years ago. And I dare say religion in 10 or 20 years is going to be quite a lot different from what it is today. But I really don't know. Uh, I've always been interested in um, Julian James, uh, the origin of consciousness and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. And yeah. I was wondering, is there a physiology connected with the meme? Has, it, uh, has the physiology of it challenged people, and is anyone working on it? First of all, I'm glad to mention Julian James. Actually, Julian James comes in as, as one of the minor heroes in, in, in my book on religion. Uh, uh, not, for, not for some of his better known ideas, but for his idea about decision making and his idea that, that um, all of the methods of divination that have evolved, and there's hundreds of different methods of divination that, that anthropologists have uncovered and archaeologists and historians, and that this was a, this was a sort of folk evolved decision aid. People needed to make up their minds and they were just simply unable they felt themselves unable to make decisions. So, you know, you flip a coin. Except flipping a coin is just not big enough for a really big decision, you know? You know, shall I marry you or not, you know? <laughs> uh, you want to have something which has more ritual, more weight to it, so you invent all of these different kinds of, of divination. And then, if you squint just right, you can get the gods talking to you and telling you what to do. I think that's one of the very interesting roots into a lot of religious ideas. Now, is there a physiology connected with them? There may well be. Another idea that I talk about in the book is variation in uh, susceptibility to ritual. Um, this is an idea that I first picked up from uh, uh, McLennan, an uh, anthropologist, who writing about shamanic healing. And he points out that all over the world, in folk religions, at the outset you have the, the, the priests, the, 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 the shamans or shamans are, are healers. They have rituals of healing. And they have canvassed their environments for the herbs that are, that are potent, that are both have uh, genuine uh, healing properties or anodyne properties or that are hallucinogens or that are, and all the psychoactive herbs. And they've, they've done that 
R&D, and they've got their, their potions, in effect, and they've also done R&D on how best to deliver them. And they have figured out again and again and again that a big honking great ritual is a great boost to the effectiveness of these because it, it creates a placebo effect, really. Now, if that's true, and I think so far, everything I've said is pretty, should be uncontroversial, namely that folk medicine rituals really do have significant power to alleviate pain, to make childbirth easier, so forth and so on. Then anybody who simply has a tin ear for ritual, who's just not moved by ritual, doesn't have any health insurance. Back before there was modern medicine, this was the only health insurance you could get. So there could have been strong selection pressure for those genes which created those neuromodulator systems that made people susceptible to ritual. Because those who are susceptible to ritual are going to find, for instance, childbirth a whole lot easier. Now, that would suggest that if we looked in the brain, we could find uh, neuromodulator systems, let's say, which the enhancement of which make people more dissociable, more hypnotizable, more moved by ritual, and others we could find variation. And the prediction that we should make is if we can find a pattern in those, is that the people who are most susceptible to ritual are, are in lineages, in human lineages that descend from people that had shamanic healing rituals. Now we already, we've done that, I mean the job has been done for um, lactose tolerance in adulthood. The people, how many of you can drink raw milk without getting upset stomachs? All right, now you gotta remember that you're the, that's rare. Not among human beings, not now, but among mammals, that's very rare. Mammals in general, only the infants can digest raw milk. When they pass, when they're weaned, they can no longer, that enzyme, uh, 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 the, the lactase enzyme just, just goes dormant. And it's prolonged in those of us who are the descendants of people who were dairy herders. And that's been shown. So we could indeed find, in effect, genes for creating physiologically different brains that were differentially susceptible, say, to religious ritual. Now, Dean Hamer thinks he's found that. He wrote that book called The God Gene. Uh, that is not. The evidence is thin in that book, and a lot of people that I've talked to in the field say they're way premature for him to make any such claims. And there's many other genes that, that could play just as, just as clearly well. But I, I don't rule it out as a possibility at all. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, speak to how uh, a modern, overwhelmingly secular society has kind of shaped the role that religion plays. And, um, whether it be like uh, the mega church, uh, kind of how we can fit Jesus into your daily schedule, or uh, um, maybe another example. You're from Boston, so um, you know you're familiar with the Unitarian Universalists, and with, with the Unitarian Universalists, yeah, yeah, sure. and how they have kind of a very loose set doctrine, but I mean can still take in you know discontents from other religions and provide them with answers to unanswerable questions. And. Yeah, I don't have anything short to say about that. I have quite a bit to say about that in the book. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I, I don't think I have a... I just gave too long an answer. I don't, I don't want to do another too long answer. All right, thank you. Yeah. It's a good question. Too good. Yeah. I just want to ask, uh, Islam is not a very popular religion in the West. I know it's popular in Africa because there are a lot of polygamy that take place. But why is it so popular all over the world? Why is it so growing? That's a very good question, and, and I wish I knew the answer to it. Um, part, of the answer, part of the answer about why it's growing is, is pure demographics. Um, uh, Islam is not making many converts. Islam is making many babies. And there are religions that are doing even better than that. And they're not making many converts either, I mean, in terms of percentages. And those are the Anabaptists. That is, the Hutterites and the Amish. And the way they do it is by 
preventing the offspring from having access to the culture. They, are, they try to hermetically seal them into their particular culture and keep the modern world away from them. And it seems to work. So one of the, one of the predictions, if that's on the right track, is that those in Islam who are trying to prevent the education, particularly of young women, know what they're doing. They may not know why this is the right move to make from their perspective, but that is, in fact, the key feature to, this, to the growth of Islam is the restriction on education. I'm not saying that's proven. I'm saying it's an interesting hypothesis. Um, do you feel that the evolution of religions is due to artificial selection or natural selection? A lot of the terminology you use kind of implies artificial, you know, you say design and yeah. um, domestication, that type of thing. And if that's the case, who are the stewards or the designers and how do they benefit? But on the other yeah. hand, I mean, if it's natural selection, then its only purpose is to just replicate itself and make more of itself. So what do you, yeah. where do you good. take a stand on that? That's very good. Um, if you haven't read The Origin of Species, you should read it. It's, it's a wonderful book. It's great literature. So, you know, we atheists, we read the Bible as literature, and it's a wonderful book as literature. And uh, Darwin's book is wonderful, too. It's a great read. And he begins the book with a brilliant bit of pedagogy. First, he describes artificial selection, what he calls methodical selection. And then he describes what he calls, and I'm so grateful to him for his choice of words, he calls unconscious selection. Unconscious selection was the way, in fact, domestication got started. It was the people weren't trying to improve the breed or anything of the sort. They were simply favoring some animals and not others. They were eating the runts or something like that. They were not, and they weren't trying to do anything. But their actions were having a strong effect on differential survival. And so domestication of animals and plants started with a process of unconscious selection, and then gradually it became more and more knowing, more and more methodical. So he tells all that story, and then he shows that now we start with would-be intelligent designers, then we go through people who may be intelligent, but they're not even paying attention to what they're doing, and nevertheless unconscious selection is happening, and then he segues into you can eliminate the middleman entirely. You can get rid of the, the human selector in either the conscious or unconscious form, and you have natural selection. But there's, it's a brilliant way of introducing the idea, except it creates one misleading artifact, and that is the idea that artificial selection and unconscious selection are not varieties of natural selection. They are varieties of natural selection. There are varieties of natural selection in which the selective force happens to run through the nervous system of a particular other species. So that a dachshund is just as much a product of natural selection as a weasel. The, the short legs uh, were, were sort of planned uh, anticipated by human beings in the case of the dachshund, but that doesn't make it not a case of natural selection. So in a way, it doesn't matter. And I'm talking about all three processes. I'm saying that the original religious ideas, the ancestors, you might call them the proto-religious memes, were products of just plain natural selection with no human nervous system involvement really at all. But almost immediately, we began to get unconscious selection. People weren't trying to spread these ideas, these superstitions and so forth. The ones that were more memorable, more unforgettable, simply spread at the expense of the others. That's unconscious selection. Gradually, people became, in the same way they did with domestication, gradually people became more reflective about this and began to think about harnessing these features of their world for various purposes of their own. So we get all three varieties. You get something like Vatican II. That's uh, mimetic engineering. That is the attempt to redesign a religion to make something better. And as usual, order the second rule holds. Evolution is cleverer than you are. 
Stark uh, 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 and his, Rodney Stark and his colleagues argued that Vatican II was a blunder by the Catholic Church. That, and that with the best of intentions, they, they redesigned Roman Catholicism in a way that, that they've been doing ever since because they, they adjusted features which uh, uh, damaged the, the religion uh, severely. Uh, these next two questions will be the last two questions. Look at the development of uh, religion in Western cultures. Uh, the United States, from its inception, was intended to be a very secularist um, uh, country, whereas many of the other Western countries, England and, and many of the European countries, um, have state religions. Yet when you look at the evolution of those, of those, of those countries um, over the past 200 to 250 years, we've become much more religious in our, our um, policy, whereas they become increasingly secular. I just wondering if you had any, any thoughts on the evolution of uh, the religions just in Western culture alone. Um, this is a much debated topic in, in, uh, in the uh, academic fields that look at, at religion and, and whether the United States is the exception or Europe is the exception uh, are, are hotly debated with people coming down on both sides. Um, I think in fact that what we're seeing is a something of a statistical blip because it may be that there's a religious revival now underway in Western Europe in some places. Uh, uh, and it's also, I think, just manifestly clear that the uh, claims about this sort of hyper-religiosity in the United States are much, much exaggerated. And a lot of that is a sort of uh, uh, famous for being famous amplification. And that uh, I think just to put it bluntly, since November, we've already begun to see that some of the uh, uh, stereotypes that we've developed about, about American religiosity in the last 20 years or 10 years are, are probably uh, uh, severely exaggerated. But it's a very good topic, and it's because I want to know more about this that I wrote the book. And my book is like most philosophical books, it's more questions than answers. I'm trying to get the questions clear so that I can get help from empirical researchers to answer them. I don't. I have my own inter my own hunches, but they're not they're not well supported by data yet. Okay. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, as you said before, um, it's possible to exist as a so-called moral person without the guidance of a specific god or religion or doctrine. Yeah. Um, so what purpose or role do you think organized religion holds for today's society, aside from a form of comfort or security? Um, if we are moving towards a lifestyle of self-direction and a logical approach to like the meanings of life and all that. Well, that's of course a huge question. Um, and I've got to give a short answer. So I better make each word count. Um, I think that what we might call moral teamwork, the capacity of religions to create large infrastructures, human infrastructures that can engage with, in common cause and that can, to be blunt, can raise funds and direct large groups of people to devote thousands and thousands of person hours to various projects there are moral projects. This is one of the most wonderful things about religion, but it's also, of course, one of the most dangerous. Because when you look at that, and believe me, a lot of people have been looking at this and, and have been effectively saying, why can't we make a secular organization that has the same cohesiveness, the same loyalty, the same, uh, the same uh, passion that religions do? And it's not clear. Why? But one answer, which I hope is not the truth, is because religions depend on excusing you, and not only excusing you, but in, in encouraging you not to ask for reasons about some of the paths, not to be, not to be critical, and simply to take without criticism or, or argument some of the things that you're being told. And they make, in fact, a virtue of this. And that, of course, sits very hard with a secularist. 
Um, I discuss this in some detail in the book. And I've recently, I, uh, I'm glad you asked me this question. I'm glad it's the last question because uh, I was asked recently by, by a, a, a group of secular humanists, um, you know, what I thought they should do to sort of try to build on the current wave of publicity that secular humanism and atheism and, and, and uh, naturalism is getting uh, in the wake of my book and Dawkins' book and, and Sam Harris and so forth. And I said, well, how about this? How about asking yourselves, what cause can we get behind that our members would tithe for? And if you think about taking that as a goal, uh, you, you begin to realize one of the things that religion has that secular organizations by and large don't. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. And let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs>